As you know, I'm a big fan of the movies. I, Ben Blacker, host of the Writers' Panel, love the movies. I love some movies. And you know, I do love more than movies, movie podcasts. And now, one of the greatest movie podcasts of all time, which is not an exaggeration, is available right here on the Forever Dog Podcast Network. It's called Black Men Can't Jump in Hollywood. This beloved podcast reviews films with leading actors of color and analyzes them in the context of race and Hollywood's diversity issues. And also, it's funny as hell. The hosts are terrific. Jared, James, and John have an incredible back catalog of over 150 movies that you can check out right now. And they've got brand new episodes every Monday featuring discussions about brand new movies like Night School, Crazy Rich Asians, Black Panther, whatever the big movie out that weekend is, the guys are on it, and you want to hear the conversations that they're having. So, movie lovers, culture lovers, politic lovers, comedy lovers, podcast lovers, this is your new favorite show after the writer's panel. Subscribe to Black Man Can't Jump in Hollywood on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts right now. Now, Here's today's episode. Forever! Dog! Hello, Writers Panel listeners. This is Brett, the producer. And on today's episode, Ben sits down with the creator of the Amazon original series, Patriot, Steve Conrad, for a compelling and in-depth interview. We hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please give the Writers Panel a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or the app of your choice. We really appreciate it. It helps other people find out about the show who might not already know about it. So thank you so much. And now... On with the show. They write, they talk, and talk about what they write. Tune in tonight, or whenever the time is right. It's the Writer's Panel with Ben Blacker, and it's starting now. Oh, yeah! People are still discovering the show. It's not like, I mean, there'll be marketing that right. creates a little push to come to the mm-hmm. studio and see the thing, but I don't know. I, I like a steady... Whenever someone's interested, I'm glad to do it because there are every week. There's new people coming coming to the show. That's great. I mean, to put something out there and then have whoever the higher ups are only look at that first impression can be tough, right? Yeah. You work hard on the thing, and to know that it's surprising people and people are discovering it over two, three years now. That it has a sustaining yeah. energy due to people being excited about it it's it means more than marketing I think that's true in this in, in this really cluttered era mm-hmm. of I know that I won't watch something unless somebody I like tells me yeah. I would like it that's it the only way that. to cut through now right yeah. it's the only way to really find something because there yeah. is so. my brother has to say check it out <laughs> right. or a friend has to say check it out and yeah 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 um, let's, uh, let's start at the beginning here and I just for people who don't know because people are still Discovering Patriot. Will you just sort of give the two sentence pitch, uh, and then I want to go deep on this show. Sure. The show eludes that. Two it does. Seven, but let me. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, a an intelligence officer in a in a uh, department that it actually exists <laughs> in a in a. Uh, cover that actually exists, which is to to uh, pretend to be a business person, but then to have to acquire immediately enough of a field of knowledge to passively be in this complicated field. They exist, and uh, our story is about a uh, an intelligence officer who quickly finds himself in over his head in his day job simultaneously to finding himself in over his head at his real job. But, and as I hear myself say this, it sounds like <laughs> it's spoofy and yeah. broad, but it isn't. It, it explores the feat of endurance that lying, misrepresenting, or not being sure-footed as you walk through your life, the toll that that can can take on a human being. Yeah. This was really my question as I was as I was watching the first season for the second time and preparing to talk with you about it. Is what is the show about for you? 
What was the, and maybe it comes back to like, what was the spark for this show? I don't know if those are different things or if the, the theme of the show is discovered later for you, but what story are you looking to tell or what theme are you looking to explore with this show? Well, we have a, we have a character who is being challenged to finish a feat of endurance, really, which has a, a places demands on him physically and mentally and it seemed to coincide with the uh, obligation we have to tell this story over hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. like you can make those two simultaneous the deeper we get into episodes the deeper the strain on the character because he has to simply keep going as obstacles mount and then as his uh, his set of coping mechanisms starts to fall by the wayside it, it I wanted to see how far we could take that and still be good, like to have the, that math continue to add up to tension and illumination about his character. So our goal was to have a story that kept unraveling mm -hmm. uh, and then kept compounding in terms of the amount of tension that it created. Though primarily, when we sat down to figure to to figure this show out, uh, a small group of writers and and. Uh, I mean, we agreed that primarily we'd be making suspense and that anything else had to go. And if whatever we could fit into that box, mm -hmm. we could take with us. But if it, if it didn't ultimately add up to suspense, then we wouldn't put it in the show. So there aren't, so the show doesn't have standalone jokes. No. Every, the, the, if it makes you laugh, it makes you laugh because the characters are demonstrating some temporary, you know, kind of blind weakness. Uh, when they should be um, demonstrating strength, mm -hmm. it's like all of us every day have those moments Absolutely. where you know our, our our inner shortcomings, right? Our inner weaknesses just we can't keep them. We can't keep the lid on them anymore. They they just explode. They explode. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah, yeah. This world around him. Well, we thought. Well, how do we make that suspense? And it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not new to us. The, you know, among our models, Dog Day Afternoon has that same energy. Mm -hmm. That there's a For sure. a band of unfit uh, <laughs> characters who have an ambitious goal that will elude them almost immediately. Yeah. It eludes them, and you keep watching. Not just despite that, but because of that, but because they are in over their heads, and now unaccomplishable goal becomes more compelling to, to watch. Absolutely. And I love the part of what's so interesting about this first season anyway, that goal is so small. It's so large, but it's so small. And, and you know, you and the writers sort of go out of your way to minimize that goal in a lot of ways, saying it is about getting from point A to point B. Right, that but, seems like such a simple thing. Right, but when we were analyzing what we considered successful executions of suspense, they were mm -hmm. all, you know, almost to a movie, pretty simple. What were some of those? A oh, simple plan mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a really strong one. Uh, this suspense overlaps a little bit with, with noir in a way mm -hmm. that's interesting to me. Um, there's a quote by Roger Ebert about noir that we wrote down because it's such a handy... Um, way of reducing what can seem complicated. When you make your decisions about what's going to happen next, Roger wrote that film noir is about characters who are smart enough to hatch a plan, but not smart enough to pull it off. <laughs> That's a yeah, perfect description. It, it's pretty great. It's fantastic. And the movies of which that is true became hallmarks for, for Patriot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, wondering why it is that the when that works, the thing works. Yeah. It's mysterious. Like, why are you watching someone essentially struggle? Or why is that rewarding? Right. And, and yeah. I think that's a good... The second part of that is a really great question. Right? Yeah. Why is that rewarding? And why are we going to watch this for 10 hours? You know, it's one thing... And the, the show reminds me a lot of sort of the light suspense of some of the Hitchcock movies of North by Northwest or The Man Who Knew Too Much, where you're rooting for this guy and things keep going wrong, right? And they, you know they're clever enough to find a way out of it if they can clever their way out of it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We laid those out, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to take a turn away from, from the Hitchcock model because generally with Hitchcock, 
it's a um, sort of an innocent person who all of a mm-hmm. sudden is thrust into these circumstances that they didn't yeah. create. That's with, a with yeah, with real noir, your character yeah. they create those circumstances. No Country for Old Men, mm-hmm. and going back, getting the money, bringing the water, like the, mm-hmm. the small decisions that create greater obstacles and um, uh, different rifts, ravines, problems, fault yeah. lines. Like these are the they cascade down from uh, decisions to act. Yeah, and with Hitchcock. It's not always the case. Now, his movies, are, they function beautifully, right. but along a different model than we use. Yeah. On, on it's more things happening to the characters rather than the character deciding right. to yes. do things. Now, I personally, when we decide we're going to spend, you know, at this stage, we're 18 hours into this st- story. Uh, I find myself invigorated by studying, trying to comprehend why I keep making bad decisions. <laughs> like, why well, I should know by now. Right. Right? This is a bad idea. <laughs> and you hope, oh, there's always that little, you know, you roll the dice and Absolutely. go, God, it has to be sevens at some point. Right? And the longer it's not sevens, the more you say to yourself, well, now it has to be sevens mm-hmm. because it hasn't ever been sevens. Like, it's, it's in my hand. It will be the next roll. Sure. And then, but the... Laws of probability say that that's no that's <laughs> right. no more likely. You have the same odds. You just feel Every it, time. Yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah. feel it in Absolutely. your soul. Uh, I, and that's the personal state. Yes, right? that's the. And I also think that's funny. Absolutely, to, that's human folly. Yes. Now it gets funnier <laughs> when you when John's not alone anymore. When he has now a small group of people who are now as a unit deeply in over their heads and one of the I'm allowed to talk about season two Absolutely. Uh, the studio said it's okay now <laughs> that one of the shifts that were, were that I'm, I was most excited about is that John goes from being uh, tremendously isolated in his workplace and then challenged to to uh, maintain his cover of this you know mid-level industrial piper that he's not able to sustain that anymore and more and more people very quickly at Macmillan start to know the truth and it, it, I don't think it gives too much away to say that these this does not become a deficiency for him like he hmm. there are circumstances now that Ichabod can help him at due to Ichabod's special sensitivity that Ichabod knows the bird bath knows Dennis knows at this point but pretty soon the cat gets out of the bag and John rather than to uh, be vulnerable to this to the secret getting out he is able to have a weird set of uh, assets and friendships and energy and uh, s- compatibility and hmm. generosity and now he still must then go do this thing in season two where he ultimately is going to be all by himself but I'll, he doesn't have to Hmm. pretend anymore for 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 most of his day we really get to spend more time with John Tavner mm-hmm. versus John Lake that's interesting um, and again a, a nice deepening of the characters and of the world for that I wonder though on this sort of surface level you know this show isn't just a noir uh, it's also a spy story it's also a family story does and, and let's talk about the spy story for a second um does that change in his situation move it farther away from a spy story? Can you still use those tropes in the way you used in the first season? Yeah, there, there are so many to, to explore, undermine, and then, and then use. Mm-hmm. Um, undermine is a good word for it. Yeah, well, they, they, so I, here's the way it works for me, if you're interested in this. Absolutely. So I have a, a small company in Chicago. It's, uh, it's three people and uh, me. Mm-hmm. And they're young, um, but they it, each of them loves film, and those it's the uh, well, the only qualification I ask when someone comes to work for Elephant is that you just have to love that art form, uh, and they they are capable of watching six movies a day, talking about them. Uh, it's we won't start to write something until we've if if it goes in a. A genre space that we sit and we watch that genre for a mm-hmm. while and we try to figure out how we can contribute to it versus imitate it. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, the 
power that comes from not just being happy to be there, but the power that comes from loving the thing and wanting to count mm -hmm. right as a, as a goal. You don't always reach it, but we always start with that goal. Like we now we watched uh, the the spy thing. It's not quite a genre. It's more suspense with the subgenre mm -hmm. of of the spy thing. But it has its. Um, the way we the way we talk about it, which is really particular, but it makes sense. And uh, I, I went back to my old college just this week to talk to some young filmmakers, and we happened on this way of identifying what you don't want to do, right? And we were talking about when you're younger. I told a story about being in bands when I was younger, and how when you're not the singer or I was a drummer and the singer's singing a new song for you for the first time and the the way your energy and your passion just dips <laughs> like it went off a cliff when he says desire and then you know that he's going to have rhyme it yeah. with fire <laughs> yeah. and then he does and then you just you, it's all you can do to just keep your arms moving playing the drums because <laughs> you just don't care anymore well movies do that movies yeah. rhyme like that and we try to find those rhymes in in uh, the intelligence and spy subgenre hmm. and then try to avoid them yeah and or you subvert them or undermine yeah, them. Yeah, and then almost in what every is your take on them? Right. So you, if you pull this apart, you would notice this about Patriot that rather than being a serial womanizer, yeah. John, a great amount of tension comes from John actually being in a in a in one relationship. Yeah. That that the devotion he has to that person can make him more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So. That's one, and then the idea that you have uh, gadgets, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, we mess around with that, and he doesn't have any, and yeah. allies, he has none, and uh, they, are, they are there to be, to be noticed, appreciated, and then avoided, I think, if, <laughs> sure. if you wanted to do this over hours and hours. Now, if you're making yeah. a film, it's good fun. But if you get six, seven hours into this relationship with an audience, I think you have to, uh, you have to demonstrate to them that they're in good hands it's, you've done some of this thinking Absolutely. it's your obligation to do this thinking to be you know so hour nine doesn't make hours one through eight um, useless or okay. now all of a sudden not valuable because that can happen too you can love a show you start to feel where it's going and then it hits a brick wall and then you want all those hours back. It's like a relationship that goes bad. You think, well, what, I want all that time back. And yeah. um, So, so the, the deeper you get into it, the greater that promise is to try to be satisfying in that way. Mm -hmm. So we have really simple principles. We don't start writing until we know the ending. And then mm -hmm. we don't write past the ending, which is uh, an adage that I picked up somewhere, which has given us quite a lot is don't write past it get there um, and do, do that hard work of the engineering and that uh, that's um, the blueprint that you have to make if you don't know quite what you're making it's not going to be structurally sound mm -hmm. and I want to talk about that in a minute um, but I, I want to backtrack again and just discuss um, the tone of this show uh, and and you know, the characters in this show. And I think when I recommend this show to people, it's in the same breath as uh, Better Call Saul and uh, Fargo. I mean, there's a, there's a cohen -y bent to this where every character is a character. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of what makes 10 hours watching this so pleasurable. It's, right. It has the a, most minor of characters. Well, that was part of it too, that decision to have a wide bandwidth of tone but mm -hmm. over time. And when we simplify things at work, it, it's along these lines. Like the people in your life who you spend the most time with are people who are multidimensional. We all have a friend who's morose, who's a drag, and they're fun for a while. But um, in small doses, right? And then the friends that I, I, you find yourself inclined to spend the most time with are people who they can be funny, but they can also be serious. And it's not so unlike that, that proposition. Like this thing is going to be in your house. It's going to be in your bedroom that it ought to have uh, a personality that deserves to be there. So it was a decision. 
Now, having said that, it is a little bit of a high wire act to pull that off. Like you, you, and when I've had features go south that I didn't mm-hmm. film, um, it's almost always because the, the tone wasn't accommodated or anticipated that, that all of a sudden you feel like you're watching two movies. It has a schizophrenic energy and then you, it breaks the spell. Yeah. So we have a trick on Patriot that allows us to do to have a, a, a really wide breath, which is with the, the songs. Mm-hmm. When the songs happen... Well, and we should stop and explain what this is for people who don't know. Oh, um, right. And, and yeah. I will let you, because I'm curious hard, to hear... Hard to explain. How that, how that worked its way in. Was that baked in from the beginning? Was yes. that something you discovered? Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. So, John, the main character, expresses himself. Well, okay, this goes hand in hand with that compulsion to try to understand the genre and then mm-hmm. contribute to it, where you, 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 if you watch the... Bond series mm-hmm. that the, they they just walk the body they just walk past the body count like it never gets considered and I think if if, if you were watching that in an ag, in an ag, aggregate it would start to bother you that that person on our eight is still continuing to walk past bodies because you, you, you can't simply say that this person is a professional, therefore he has cold blood. A, a human being can't walk past the corpse and not be stunned right. into some consideration of what they're looking at. Yeah. So I thought, well, uh, w- rather than to pretend that that isn't the case, why don't we find a way to be entertaining with that, mm-hmm. with that notion of consideration? And what if, because our characters are allowed to have complexity... What's the most tension-filled next characteristic would be a compulsion to be honest at the same time that they're involved in having to be deceitful. And songwriting, when it's at its best, feels very honest. So I thought, well, there, what if you could make those two cooperate? Mm-hmm. And that could have gone disastrous. <laughs> sure. If we didn't find... That's the highlight. Yeah, if we didn't Absolutely. find Mike Dorman. Yeah. For example, who was a musician before he was an actor, it wouldn't have felt uh, authentic. Well, Mm -hmm. in any uh, event, our main character is given at any moment to expressing himself through song. But it's not a musical that the world doesn't start to dance around him. It it is in his head largely or in these moments where he will perform in public in an organic way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you you are allowed an insight into his interior life through these through these songs. So what that gives us in terms of managing tone is a slightly new genre to have at our disposal, which is the musical. And in the musical, you are granted long moments of suspension of, of uh, disbelief. We are, we are short of the musical where if John was on a train, the other passengers and the conductor would be performing a syncopated dance behind him. That doesn't happen, but it's the same... It's the same break uh, with the laws of the universe that we can stop the show and put on a song. So it, it establishes a tone that is still inventing itself on, on mm-hmm. Patriot. Like we haven't figured out where the spell breaks. Now, for certain people, the spell breaks if John doesn't perform action fast enough. For some people, the spell is cast more greatly because he doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, our audience is allowed to sort of come to the show, the show like that. Like the show has its own rhythm, and mm-hmm. over time you'll get it. I think that's true. I think it's a hard show to watch the first episode um, and be all in. Although it's a hard show not to be all in because you want to live with these characters. So well, badly. you have to be a certain. You have to kind of be up for it. You I guess that's be, true. Yeah, like yeah. If, you, if you like, you can't get that into it if you think you're only watching mm-hmm. a spy show. Yeah, that's so, true. So if someone has to set the table just a little bit for you yeah. and say it'll do that, it scratches that itch. It's a, that's a goal of ours to be good at that too, but it has other things on its mind. True. I want to get to the sort of um, nuts and bolts part of uh, just selling this show, uh, which is a weird show to understand. Um, and so once, once the concept was formed for you, was it pitched? Was it written? What did it look like in the beginning stages? Well, there was a, a, 
just the the idea that you could take a kind of macro plot, which is really familiar. You know, we have a another thing we do at the office when we talk about plot, like spy show plot. Mm-hmm. And if you if you if you, it's so. The, my company is called Elephant, but it's so Elephant. The, one of the guys who helps me with the show most closely, Bruce Terrace, mm-hmm. came up with this way of describing plot when we talk about plot. So he took something from Team America and something from Jason Bourne. He calls it Durka Durka Treadstone, which <laughs> okay. is so Durka Durka. If you love Team America, <laughs> is just the catchphrase for mm-hmm. this conversation, plot, dialogue, exposition. You don't really have to understand. Yeah. They just say Durka Durka. Full bottom in, uh, in Joss Whedon's yes. land. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then Treadstone is the only thing you hear when you're watching board. You don't know what it is. You just go with Treadstone. But it resets you. You're like, oh, yeah, the, the Treadstone plot. Well, right. I don't understand any of it, but I love this movie. Yeah. So, it somehow grounds you despite it Treadstone, being so effective. Right. <laughs> so That's really we have our Durka Durka Treadstone plot. <laughs> so my pitch was we take, the, we take that. We like that. We try to be good at that. But then we also try to, underneath it, have this whole world that can keep uh, surprising and hopefully delighting you. Uh, and meanwhile, we'll try to stress test how long those two things can mm-hmm. run in an accord right? and still feel like they are traditional in that important way and that you're watching a story uh, that is important, right? The... Um, the, the set of notes everybody's used to getting from the studio, the, the, the studio notes one-on-one, pacing, stakes, mm-hmm. right, tone. Those are the th- only three things you ever... They're just different variations of those three notes. Um, I had been doing it long enough that those were... I knew they were coming, and I thought, what if you could make a show that just defied <laughs> all of the instantly relatable way to talk about stakes and pacing yeah. and tone like get under them all and turn them inside out so when I sat down with Amazon I, I mentioned that I would like the chance to do that with the show uh, and in the in the early going with Amazon uh, they had an, a, an appetite to, to make mm-hmm. something distinctive along these lines and so here we are oh, at the end of season two and they were they were up for that um I don't. It, so, in in a lot of respects, it's just dumb luck that for a moment in time there was a studio that thought that was a good idea. <laughs> Maybe, but they also trusted you to do it. I mean, you have this career as a screenwriter, feature writer, um, and you know the, you've made a bunch of movies. They don't feel like this show. No, well, that's why I did this show. That, that I have been. Kids, but, you know. Just, um, some of them work, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the ones I had a hand in as sure. a writer, and some of them don't. And um, and that's features. I mean, we should sure. talk about this. If you do it, yeah, if you do it more, than, more than twice, it's going to happen. But um, I could never get the thing I had in mind hmm. through that way. And what I would do is, it was a really bad idea because it never worked. But there'd be the. I would write all these, and the ones that ended up getting made were the ones that were the closest to something you could call mainstream, right? Mm-hmm. But the ones I loved, no one knows about because no one ever made them, but they're the lion's share of the way that I write. Mm-hmm. So most of my scripts that were never produced are so much like Patriot. Going back to being 21 years old, just no one cared to make them. And those were the ones I held on to to direct because I thought they gave me the best chance right. to make something worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And the ones that got out into the world, I didn't care to direct because they weren't close enough mm-hmm. to uh, the goal I had with... And, you know, next thing you know, time goes by and they're still not making those movies. The ambition of the feature world contracted to the point where it there isn't any anymore. Uh, and in a really lucky uh, stroke... The ambition of television just necessarily had to change. So uh, I had the chance with Patriot finally to take that the thing that I loved about my writing that was being marginalized and never discovered um, and throw it all into one 
one show and take a swing with it. Mm-hmm. So it isn't like my writing, but my, my writing on film isn't like right. my writing. It's not like your writing that's been made public. It's, it's like no, what your right. actual writing is. Right. The ones I have that you can like Chad Schmidt is mm-hmm. something that I wrote that you can read, but mm-hmm. it was never made, which is so Patriot. Interesting. I wrote a script called Aloft, which is Patriot. Huh. Um, I wrote a script called A Parking Ticket, which is very Patriot. All right. But yeah, Pursuit of Happiness is not paying. No. Yeah, but it's so a movie it's, that they'll make. It's funny, I do wonder about, you know, getting getting what you want to write and this very specific tone, this kind of world, this kind of plotting even, but specifically the tone down on the page, so it's understandable. Well, so there's that. And, and, and But here's the other aspect of that, which is critical, which is why at some point along the line, I just decided, like, I... You, there's too much uh, space between you and the director. It, it, something's going to mm-hmm. get lost between the crack, between the bed and the wall. Like, uh, it's where the, all the good stuff falls. And yeah. uh, in in many respects, it's your relationship with the actor. Like tone on the page, all of a sudden you're there and with a human, and these things have to you know be performed by a human. And if I can't form a partnership with that person like that the balance of that tone like it's it won't be direct it won't be strong it won't be deep so uh we were also able at amazon which was uh rare to cast anybody i wanted hmm. which meant terry o'quinn and hmm. kerwood smith uh and michael dorman versus being you know, on a on a network, and we would have been probably forced to use somebody who had a who, who wasn't as and just had a, mm-hmm. more celebrity. Like we, they Absolutely. never, they never asked us to hire celebrities. They allowed us to hire great actors. Yeah. So it feels like I, a cast of character actors yeah, in the best way. Yeah, but they're all capable of Absolutely. owning the scene. Yeah. But we have. I mean, it, it is it is a testimony to how great our ensemble is that Michael Chernus yeah. has you know 15 pages every episode where Michael Chernus could carry his own show he yeah. could play my brother could play my brother could do Summer Heights High and play every character in that thing right. but everybody takes their turn and this year Deborah Winger joined our cast and it's oh. the same thing that Deborah is capable of of sustaining a drama all by herself but mm. came on a Patriot and became one of our our ensemble in a way that she added a brand new sound to our thing, right. a new sensibility, a new strength. We have a different potency, but she fits right in. Uh, and I end up, I, Deborah has 20 pages, and she could have 60 years. But it, it works on Patriot, and I can then parse out the tone. Like, my brother can be a little broader than, <laughs> than most of the characters, because you you get his enthusiasm yes. to do that. He, he, he lights up. Yes. Kurtwood specializes... Well, you can't limit Kurtwood Smith, but yeah. Kurtwood has this um, beautiful, humane rhythm of uh, delivery where you don't know what he's going to say next, but the thing mm-hmm. he says next feels like it's the only thing he could have said. And then Terry is just at, at magisterial at this point in being... Uh, powerful driven and then at the same time frustrated Mm -hmm. that the world can't fall into line for this moment that he has a Shakespearean energy of I'm going to make one bad decision that will then allow everything to fall in line and when it turns out that that bad decision just creates an infinite field of new complications he has that power of an actor say I'm going to put my head down I'm going to drive through them and I am going to come out the other side now he's carrying his son with him and his right. son doesn't have that exact yes. formidability yeah. so watching how far each can go season two is, is really where cool. the tension comes from is uh, at some point John has to he can't he can't write songs he's got to go hmm. he's just got to go and we see what that does to him oh interesting would you buy a t-shirt for $50 if you knew it only cost $7 to make we wouldn't we meaning Everlane where you never overpay for quality clothes 
Everlane only makes premium essentials using the finest materials without traditional markups. And they tell you their real costs so you know you're not overpaying. And they're high quality products. That's me not reading. I'm just saying that. They want you to know what you're paying for and why. They're radically transparent about every step in the process from the materials they use to the ethical factories they work with. Everlane's clothes look better, cost less, and last longer. I can vouch for the first two, but I just got my Everlane clothes, so I can't tell you how long they last. But it's been two weeks. That's pretty good. Usually I throw stuff away after, like, four days. Just throw away my clothes, crumple them up, throw them in the trash. Essentials like Everlane's Cotton Crew t-shirt are exactly what they should be. Simple, stylish, made from quality materials. I picked out a whole bunch of Everlane clothes, including... A nice corduroy pant. Yeah, you're thinking Los Angeles corduroys? Yeah. They're lightweight, slim like I like. Uh, I got a nice uh, midweight twill pant as well. Really comfortable, really nice. I got the wash black, but you do you. Um, I got some slim fit shirts. The cotton slim fit, the chambray slim fit. Great colors, great style. They really fit perfectly. I am weirdly shaped in that I am like 80% legs and um, a very narrow torso, so like the European cut tends to fit me better. Um, But these Everlane clothes fit me perfectly. I also got some stuff from my wife, including the clean silk knot shirt in olive. It looks terrific. Got the nice wool Academy blazer in peat. Also looks terrific. Fit perfectly. I wouldn't wear those together because it's green on green. It looks weird, but still. Great. Um, so I highly, I do highly recommend uh, Everlane. Their timeless essentials are just what you're looking for. No frills, just quality. That's true. I am a simple man, and I don't like frills. Uh, but these are high-quality clothes at really, like, ridiculous prices. Right now, you can check out your personalized collection at everlane.com slash panel, P-A-N-E-L, plus you get free shipping on your first order. I don't know how they're making money. Doesn't matter. Take advantage of it. Everlane.com slash panel, E-V-E-R-L-A-N-E dot com slash panel. Um, that, and that is, again, was this family aspect baked in? Was it something discovered? Yeah, it was, it was in there because it, it also creates fault lines. I don't know if, I don't expect anybody to know anything about this, but it's just research kicked us up at the office. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Dulles brothers uh, had a weird little incestuous control over some policy in Washington mm-hmm. for a while. There were two brothers and a sister, and uh, yeah, they went, went, and now we're watching this happen in real time now, uh, today with the conflation between family and government. It's a bad idea. Yeah. It's a, I mean, we've created laws that are supposed to stop you from doing it because you will owe someone in your family something more than you would owe someone, someone in your government. Of course. And it becomes a much more complicated and nuanced sure. uh, yeah. transaction. Right, but it still it still happens. But So I, I guess I just wanted the thing to be less about a niche, hard-to-relate mm-hmm. um, field and for us to, as an audience, to say, well, I, my dad asked a lot of me, not in the way that you know, but I think but this is the metaphor, right? Yeah, this is the you, dramatic just, version. You want to live inside that because it's just closer to home. Yeah, and then for sure. it's cool to think that can be just as exciting or that, that can be just as riven with uh, complications and frustrations and, you know, successes and rewards. And mm-hmm. it's it, it, because they are the features of our life doesn't mean they can't be the features of our entertainment. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I want to ask about some of the specifics on this show, starting with piping <laughs> and why piping and some of those long runs, which yeah. I mean, I'm sure you get this all the time, but where they have to just monologue, any actor has to monologue oh, the, the specifics the of the piping, yeah. the nonsense of the specific feel. Well, that came are from. so much fun to watch. Yeah, that came from. Flying, I was flying a lot for a job. Mm-hmm. 
and I would generally be sitting next to a business guy and I would look over at their folders or their laptops and they would just have this, you know, what seemed to me to be complete nonsense. <laughs> right. but, and I, I, I marveled at how a human being can get that into something that it can't be related to by anybody. Like it only exists to pay your bills and to put food on the table for your family, which I consider to be uh, a really admirable trait. Mm -hmm. So I ended up really, I, I liked that someone could spend six hours of a flight reading uh, about a really specialized field of knowledge that doesn't turn people on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is this is that it's hard to be passionate about it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, then, but Kerwood's character exactly. Which he is, is again a great underlining yeah, of that idea. Then it just becomes fun, yeah. rather than that, and it's sort of Durka Durka. It's the same mm -hmm. thing that these these don't sure. exist. Any the, the you know the industry doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a piping industry. <laughs> okay. No one has a piping company. It's right. a, it folds into another thing. Right. Some kind of engineering. Company. Right. Yeah. As far as I know, maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> it does exist. We certainly didn't study them or study the field at all. I thought it would oh, just be better for it to feel a little... Now, Patriot does have a little quotient of pretend in there that mm -hmm. I think gives it another color. That you know, The last thing I wanted to do was to live at some grim industrial setting for eight hours. It, it, ought, to, <clears throat> it ought to have some hallmarks of the frustrations of all of our jobs. Mm -hmm. and you're just forced to master something that you're not passionate about. I mean, this is, this is sort of a funny idea of, like, this being a somewhat made-up industry, uh, this job that John has to take. What do, you, do you, what do you think he does at his desk all day? Uh, do you have any idea? Like, I feel like that's the kind of question that that's a great screenwriting question. teachers tell their students to know the answer. Yeah, I think he has the, those 3D pipe models <laughs> that he keeps letting just spin around and it looks right. like he's studying them. Right, he looks like he is. Right. Um, the other thing I wanted to be sure to ask you about is the opening credits. Uh, it feels, they feel like this unbelievable both uh, synopsis of the show and this beautiful sort of tone poem uh, so you sort of know what you're in for. How did that come together? Uh, well, I, we we also at work try to well. So you have your credits, right? And you think, well, it's you can use them Absolutely. if if you a smart if you care to. Will. Yeah, to say this is you will be perceiving everything we do through this. Like this is the way. This is the thing you must go through to get into the place but it's not a door mm -hmm. it's a it, it operates on you and and mm -hmm. prepares you to feel elements of the show that you wouldn't ordinarily and um just trying and failing to try to find the underpinning for the decision making right to say well you will start to lose respect for john if you feel like he's making bad decisions right you just you would if you understand something of the way that he was raised and masculinized in that really American way, which is to jump off things. Right. And to, you know, smoke cigarettes at eight. And right. Then you'll think, well, this is part of a bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Now, it was instituted in him, and it can, mm -hmm. be, it can be discarded or it could be repaired uh, if that's the healthiest thing to do, but... I, once we once we got a glimpse of that kind of energy, we f just felt like it it really has a lot to say about what we have to say. Now, season two is different. I wanted. I said I would come back to talking about plotting this show, which seems so difficult to me. There's so much. There's so much to track. There's so much to get across. The you guys handle exposition in such a, a expert way where it does all come from character. And it's fun to listen to. There's clearly a fun with words in this show. Yeah. Um, but just the, the structure of the whole thing, can you talk about putting that together? Well, I assume that was a group activity. For, for sure. And it, it is the, uh, oh, the, 
principal task after which you can then do everything else. So if that doesn't happen at first, then nothing happens. That, that thing, I read once about a record somebody was making in a recording artist and he said that he doesn't put the record out until it sounds good from the other room. And that made a lot of sense to me. I, what I think that means is that the, the thing, the groove has to be right. Mm -hmm. Like the, the low end mm -hmm. has to be right. And the structure of our thing is our low end. Like it mm -hmm. has to do that job of keeping time. Mm -hmm. And you, you will, if a show gets less good at that, you'll feel yourself, you know, leaning backwards instead of leaning forwards. It is just, when I was really young, I resisted it. And then the more I worked, the more I started to feel like it would, it's only, there's nothing wrong with clarity. There is something wrong with simple-mindedness, but they're not the same thing. Like you can be, you can be clear and your structure can be identifiable without you feeling like you're not making art. Like you can do both those things at the same time. We don't fault bands for writing songs that are somewhere in the orbit of two and a half minutes to four minutes. It's a, it's a form, mm -hmm. right? And they have verses. Sometimes they just have verses, but generally verses, choruses, bridges. Uh, they, those are the tools that constitute the thing you call popular music. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with saying the thing that constitutes our thing is, is form. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to be good at it. And the better we are at that, the better we can do every other thing that we do. So we map out in a really boring way all the way around the room yeah. the, the the plot of our you know whatever our thing is yeah. 10 hours 8 hours it, it's going to have every episode's going to have it and we're going to march mm -hmm. toward this confluence of events that can't be sustained like that's our goal like to create a plot where we say these two things cannot exist in the same space and we are going to direct events so that they get there and then you'll see what happens when when that happens so that's plot for us was, yeah was that and, and I think that is it's a thing that's talked about a lot in just storytelling in general is is right that's where you want to put your character at the confluence of these events that can't sustain that's a great way to put it um, were those events figured out through not the a, plotting or was the plotting figured out through we want to wind up here and I'm sure it's we, we want to wind up here okay. really and we didn't pitch any of that to the studio we all yeah. I had was just a real simple proposition right. which is you know at the heart of so many noirs which is a lot happens between A and B right. that no one expected but among the elephant writers to say we know we want to end up in this moment yeah then we then we, we throw do. things away like mm -hmm. they'll just be you know, the, the trod over version mm -hmm. of that. And we all express that. Me, mostly, the, I do that the most. And then, you know, you, after... Th these guys that I write with are just dear friends. And no one hesitates to tell me that my idea was terrible. <laughs> Which is really valuable. Yeah, and we spend... I mean, we spend a lot of time together. And each of them has a, a writing technique that I really love. Like Bruce Terrace is uh, uh, a structuralist in the best sense, but then he also has really dark inclinations and can write beautifully about mankind in dark moments. Sean Hurley, who people might know from, um, he has a radio program called Adam's Motion in the Void, mm -hmm. and Sean is on New Hampshire Public Radio, but Sean has this mysterious soul I can think of interior complications to our motivations that would elude me like he can he can identify a thousand different ways someone can be shattered hmm. and then Zeb Frank is a person who's been working for me since he was 21 years old and he just gets the thing that will allow us to say it's done like hmm. Zev can drive us to this to, to, to throwing out the bad idea to not going down the false road uh, and then we just sit and, until we say something feels like Patriot mm -hmm. and then when it feels like Patriot we we go down that road like, for example an idea that might feel like Patriot would be an event from season one with the puppeteer and the bag and like the the motivations to 
zoom out a little bit. Someone might simply want a bag. Right. It happens. Yeah. And you get like that is a Sean Hurley idea, probably. It's interesting. I mean, I was thinking specifically about um, Saperstein. Yeah. And the it feels like having you know gotten through gone through the first season. The end goal was the cop has to wind up with the CD in her bag. And what is the most interesting way to get there, right? Or even he, she has to wind up with a picture of John in her bag. And what's the most interesting way to get there? Um, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't like that, that sort like of that, like yeah. figured out? In, was it was reverse engineered in that way? I mean, not that specific. Well, that that, that's, that's right. a really cool place to point because it has, it, it has everything that we had cared to create to get there in a way that was revelatory or humane and had something to say about John like he he could not help himself but to make these songs with this person who constituted in this moment the only light in his life and he forgot for a moment it was an indiscretion Mm -hmm. but it's so and again when we sit in that moment it's so much fun to see him smile well yeah yeah, maybe because you you, fleeting moment right if you happen to care about him (laughs) <laughs> then sure. you care that he is capable of that or someone gave yeah. him that now it only exists because ultimately it's going to create suspense yeah. so it wouldn't be in there if it didn't if it didn't add up to later creating a serious vulnerability for, for John uh, I mean Saperstein himself doesn't really have an arc he is just a mechanism yeah but he's he lights up the screen every time he's on it you're so excited to see both the tension he brings yeah. when he's in a room with John and how happy he can also make his Right. Now, now, Boone just has a great way of conveying Rob where Rob, Rob's presence in John's life creates a lot of vulnerabilities because he's just not a person who's able to... Like, he, he couldn't get with the plan. <laughs> like you could, John could say to my brother, I do this, therefore you have to keep this secret. But... but Rob's out incapable of not being an artist. Mm-hmm. It's just the things that fall out of his pockets or these. So he, <laughs> he, he can't be alone for the ride, and then now he's alone for the ride in some respects. Well, the songs for us also are ways to explore uh, that we take them seriously. Mm-hmm. We, we, the songs are not larks. They don't feel they, like jokes. You know, they're not. I will say, I mean, I only, it was only in watching the show the second time that it struck me that they're funny. Because it feels like you're looking at this guy's soul yeah. the first time around. No, they have peculiarities, but but um, no, he he cares about that, yeah. and and if for that to work, I think we have to care about them too. Sure. It's a very fun stage. We're at that stage now where we're going to record the songs for season two, and you you have to just kind of start over and think, okay, now how do we apply ourselves to this art form and try to be good at it? You know, make it seem like. Absolutely. Not everything deserves to be sung. You know, if there are words that you write that you don't sing, the singable word, the singable phrase, it creates a different challenge for us. We sit around and go, it's, it's, it's just me and Mike at this stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we um, spent a lot of time thinking about it. Both of us did that before we started to do films. Mm-hmm. So we both started out as drummers. So it's like a band that has too many drummers in it. It's not going to be good. But we do care about it a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it shows. I mean, I think that's an important lesson for you know writers who are listening to this. And I think this show has it, and some of the other stuff we've mentioned has it, which is you kind of have to care about every piece of this, this story, right? Every piece of the thing you're putting together from the characters to the plot to to the details of yeah. the song to you know the language that goes into yeah it. it's true you have to track Edward's connection to the Beastie Boys for it to make sense <laughs> that comes back in season two and it's important okay. you can't forget that uh, you gotta remember that John's nickname is Sure Shot in order to get a lot of season two funny yeah there's also I mean again in watching it I feel like were this on another network were this somewhere where people were talking about it in the same breath as Fargo, which they ought to be. Uh, a phrase like double green yeah. is a phrase that would be a men believes in dumb t-shirts. Like, I, this is a dumb question. It's not the kind of question I usually ask, but something like that, something like Cool Rick, which is how my agent talked me into watching this show in the first place. <laughs> He's like, 
He throws a guy in front of a mail truck in the first five minutes, and there's a guy named Cool Rick. You have to watch those. Like, where does this stuff come from? Well, do you know when you're when you're writing and the good the good stuff just pops into your head? Ideally, <laughs> yeah. Huh? Well, I'll accept that. We, it, so, in a, a way to make sense of that, the decisions that get applied mm-hmm. to the show would be to look in the garbage can at mm-hmm. the characters who didn't make it in, mm-hmm. and the ones who didn't make it in, they didn't call themselves Cool Rick, or <laughs> they didn't, they don't have a kayak that they're trying to sell. <laughs> right? They didn't have that thing. Yeah, so the one thing that, that, interesting that occurs results. to you and says, you know, I like, yeah, I like the way. Leslie, I would not have written him if he wasn't formerly in prison, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's that, that thing that he has the lid on mm-hmm. that is um, gonna blow, like that combustibility. That he's too tight, and you see in season two that lid explodes off of him because of the morphine that got into his system at the end of the season. <laughs> that he is utterly changed hmm. by getting shot in the face not because of what it did to his face but because of what happened to him in the hospital Absolutely. that they gave him morphine without asking his permission or without identifying him as a former addict and when he wakes up he's got new blood and Leslie the Leslie of season of season 2 is a hindrance to John not because he's a tight ass but because he has he's off the rails and they need him to be back on the rails to keep this thing moving right. toward being able to go to Iran. So we have this macro plot. Leslie has now a brand new dimension, but he's even more greatly at odds with stability and peace because of this thing John had to do right. to be able to go to the next place. But it created resonating problems. Like, mm-hmm. you know, all of our impulsive decisions when we try to force something, when you force something, you know. Something's going to break somewhere. Right. There are going to be repercussions. There are going yeah. to be ripples to that. Um, and, it, and I will say, for, again, for people who haven't seen the show, every character has this. And I'm thinking about, like, uh, Stephen's uh, aide. Yeah. Who is such a specific kind of asshole. Yeah. yeah <laughs> she's so slow. Yeah. Um, but what, I'm curious, and, and then we'll start to wrap up. What, what was that thing to hang on to for uh, Alice for you guys? For uh, John's wife? Yeah. Yeah, so when I mentioned feeling like if you thought about it and you wanted to do something a little different than the James Bond thing, like you might be able to create uh, some very serious complications from being devotional. Like if you, mm-hmm. if, if someone knew where to find you because you came home every night, maybe that would make you more vulnerable than if you slept somewhere different every night. Yeah. Uh, Caring about something makes you vulnerable. Exactly. It's true of of life too. Like when you, the older you get, you have kids. Like you live outside your body all of a sudden. Uh, the, the, well, that was true of Alice. Now, what changes for for Alice over the course of the first season and carrying to the second season that she because she closed this distance between her and her husband's walk of life that she she knows more than maybe she ought to know. And is it going to change the way she perceives the the person mm-hmm. who needs her? Um, she's learning. Yeah. What do you do when you get a fuller appreciation or a glimpse of? Yeah. When all of a sudden that person that you know you you have an obligation to isn't as strong as you thought mm-hmm. they were, or wasn't as light as you thought they were, can you stay uh, devotional to helping them and their well-being? And then um, it, 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 she comes to play a really substantial. Uh, part of season two because of the mistake that she made in season one which was to connect in in uh, a, a brief way in season one to Agatha the detective yeah and Agatha is formidable and driven and the idea that she now knows who John is married to isn't something she casts aside. She hmm. is going to control that that insight into John, and it becomes a a, a really important um, relationship to explore in season two. That these two these two characters now who have an accord, like they they're they're they 
liked each other. There was something just about they were driven to each yeah. other some yeah. way, right? And drawn to each other. And so we we explore that in season two. Like yeah, how what a bad idea that was. Now poor Tom, always <laughs> right. And he asked the impossible thing, but if you zoom out, he was right. They can't be together. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's really interesting. That's great. I can't wait. Season two is going to be great. What were uh, some of the, or were there some big challenges for you all coming into season two? Well, oh, everybody was just so excited to keep going. We didn't have those. We just had a lot of enthusiasm, a greater understanding of what Patriot can be. The challenges were just filming in Paris. Kind of, I meant uh, physical you, production. So where was it all filmed? You could tell me it was here, and I wouldn't know. You could oh, season Paris. one was Chicago and Prague. It was Prague. Okay. Yeah, it looks so good. Thank you. And, Thank you. And Chicago from Milwaukee it looks great. Really uh, Whatever that Chicago was. for uh, Amsterdam was not that fun. <laughs> but this year we we are doing Paris for Paris. I, it That's was. Cool. Uh, beyond a treat as a filmmaker to be alone yeah. there were no other films in that town in that, in that city wow. then and we were there for seven months and holy cow yeah I mean they, they they're called French hours which means they won't work more than ten hours yeah. so you have that you challenge you're not good for them yeah except for you have a feature for you no that's that's all you get uh, is this show giving you what you want creatively yeah well, yeah it is it, and um, it's it just keeps doing that too like with the songs now that they're or they're allowing us to now go and really get these songs recorded right like the, the, that's great the, uh, many of the songs are in John's head in season two so John now has electric music in his head and he has Distortion, and it, 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 it's not just him and his guitar anymore. And they've given us the means to do that. So, yeah, they have met us greater than halfway all along the line. And we, we on Patriot have this uh, streak of luck um, that we are riding, where everybody gets along. Like we don't, every, we don't have any weird energy on the show. Everybody's friends, and everybody's happy with the. With the work and um, we this, have this is all you ever want. In, in yeah, the same like same this. crew from, from you know our, our uh, brilliant cinematographer Jimmy Whitaker, mm -hmm. brilliant camera operator Jody Whitaker and Jody Miller. I'm sorry, uh, we ha are together from the pilot, which was three years wow. deep now. Yeah. Uh, so there's a vocabulary, there's a shorthand, there's uh, an honesty that comes from knowing each other that well. Yeah. Uh, it's true with the cast. So the rewards keep increasing because the the our capacity to do this thing just gets a little more understood all the time. Mm -hmm. So and then you know it's, everybody's still having fun. So there's that, mm -hmm. and it's fun to be alone in Paris and we get stuck. <laughs> We're the only ones who speak English like right. that way. So we all got tighter over That's the years. That's great. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, well, congratulations. Thank uh, you. As I said, I love season one. It's a great show. Looking forward to season two. Uh, we'll put this out either close to it, in which case people should go back and watch, or we'll put this out sooner and they can go discover season one All right. and get on board. Sounds uh, good to me. Let me, let me wrap much. up by asking you, uh, as you do have a little more time now, you're finishing up post-production, are you watching TV and movies? Are you watching anything you want to recommend to people? Anything that's getting you excited or inspired these days? I watched a great, a great movie called El, El uh, Vayu. It's V O Y O U. I think it's right. Um, it's a French movie. Um, uh, gosh, man, and, and I'm flashing back to seeing this in France. It's a Claude Lelouch movie, okay. and it messes with time in this way that is so fun and smart. Uh, it's the crook is the translation. So if, if you're trying to find it, you might have to look up the crook. But I watched it and I thought, like, it's crazy how similar it is to what we're trying to do mm -hmm. and su more successful in so many terms. That's been my favorite discovery of the last uh, few months is uh, that film, that Lelouch movie. Great. We'll tell uh, people can look for it. Uh, thanks for taking the time, Steve. All right. Thanks for your interest very much. Thank you for listening to the Writers' Panel. Tune in next Tuesday and every Tuesday for a brand new episode.
And in the meantime, please subscribe and review the Writers Panel on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. And follow me on Twitter at Ben Blacker, just like it sounds. And let me know who you want to have on the show. The Writers Panel is a co production of the Forever Dog Podcast Network and the ATX Television Festival. You can listen to more Forever Dog podcasts at foreverdogpodcast.com and keep up with the ATX Fest throughout the year at atxfestival.com. Thank you, and see you next week. Well, you'll hear me next week. Thanks for subscribing. Forever Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter and Instagram at Forever Dog Team and liking our page on Facebook.